Hi everybody, this is Liz Stanton at Synapse Energy Economics, and we're ready to get going with our webinar, New Renewable Generation Capacity, Why Here and Not There? Uh, I've got our presenters in the room ready to go, and before we let them get started, just let me go over a few logistics. So as those of you know that have joined us before, the webinar is being recorded, and afterwards, we will send out to all participants both that recording and the slides. Uh, you'll also find that recording and slides up on our website, and that's true that'll be both for this new webinar that we're doing today, as well as all of our past public webinars are up there uh, on our website for you to take a look at. Uh, all the attendees in the webinar have been muted today, so uh, you're not going to be able to ask your questions out loud with your voices, but we want you to know that we are looking forward to your questions, and uh, what we need you to do is to write them into us. The place to do that is webinar at synapse-energy.com, so just go ahead and give us an email there with your questions, and I'm going to be moderating moderating today, and I will be monitoring that email account throughout the webinar, looking at the questions that you're sending in. Um, if it's a clarification question, I might ask it sooner of the presenters, otherwise I'll wait till they're done with their presentation and then start to ask your questions then. That's for substantive questions. If instead you have an issue with your video, your audio, or some other technical issue, please use the chat function that is part of the WebEx software that you see in front of you. Uh, those are the basics. Uh, just to let you know before we get started, uh, we are Synapse Energy Economics, and we're based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We are a consulting firm uh, doing research and analysis and other kinds of uh, technical support for uh, topics related to energy, economics, and the environment. Most of our clients are uh, advocates, consumer advocates, environmental advocates, and we also do a lot of work for government agencies. Uh, so that's who we are. Uh, you'll have these slides and have a, a lot more information here that you can go back to that we're going to perhaps not say aloud as we go along to, in interest of time. So let me introduce the presenters. Uh, we have for us today Tommy Vitolo, who is Synapse's lead renewable energy expert, uh, along with uh, someone you've been hearing in our past couple of webinars, uh, Patrick Lukel, who is our chief modeler at Synapse. And thank you guys for being with us today, and I'll turn it over to you. Well, great. We're, uh, we're happy to be here today. Uh, first, we want to lay out the agenda. We're going to talk about five reasons why renewable energy just might be located here and not there, or there and not here. Uh, and they are transmission, PURPA, QF contracts, the RPS, rate making, and the PTC. Uh, and we'll get into each of them and, and give you a little bit of what we're talking about when we get started. Uh, so Patrick, I'm going to start with transmission. Uh, transmission is a bit of a historical accident, right? Wires are where they are based on utility boundaries, the location of fossil fuel source, uh, the location of large enough bodies of water for, for cooling. They're not always well situated for renewable energy. Uh, the, the places where we are renewable energy rich may not be the places where we had older fossil or nuclear plants. And so in addition to the challenge of making sure the wires are in the right place, we have this additional challenge that it can be more difficult to so-called fill up the wire. Uh, renewable energy resources are often intermittent, and the wire, which is available throughout the year, costs the same whether or not we're filling it up 100% of the time or 20% of the time. And so making transmission cost-effective for renewable energy is uh, an additional challenge that we ought to be mindful of. Uh, and so the first of two transmission stories I want to tell is the MISO MVP. Uh, MVP is a three-legged stool. MISO is uh, a region of the country that uh, manages part of the electric grid. And what the MISO organization realized is that a number of states located within MISO have policy goals about renewable energy and that MISO didn't necessarily have adequate transmission to allow its member states to meet its goals. And so it set up this three-legged stool 
where it would look for projects that added to reliability, that helped the states meet their policy objectives, and that met economic objectives that would lower cost. And as you can see from the map, these are not really big projects. These are actually a lot of relatively small transmission projects, often they're in, in, in just one state or just one utility territory. And so MISO is in the middle of this MVP process. These projects uh, have not been built yet, but they're envisioned to allow over five gigawatts of wind to get from wind-rich locations to load and in addition to improving reliability, they're also going to provide economic value. Uh, the 20 year present value of about six or seven billion dollars, the 40 year present value of over 30 billion dollars. So we haven't seen the evidence that this works yet in MISO because these projects are underway, but we have seen evidence of success in Texas. Uh, in about 2006, McKamey, Texas had 600, 760 megawatts of wind capacity and only 400 megawatts of transmission capacity. And so there was significant curtailment. And the Texas legislature decided that it was time to figure out how to get wires installed so that the renewable energy, specifically wind potential in West Texas, could make its way east to the load. They created the Competitive Renewable Energy Zones, or the CRES, uh, there was a long process by ERCOT. They created five regions, uh, two in the Panhandle, two in Central, and in McKamey, and collectively they get something like 11 gigawatts of wind to load. And um, those, these wires are actually, even though they're all in one state, there's quite a lot of wires here. Texas is big, so big it doesn't even fit on your screen. Uh, nevertheless, the story in Texas was, again, they were building wind, uh, getting it done, until 2006, 2007, 2008, when they simply put, uh, ran out of wire, ran out of capacity to get the wind to the load. They also may have seen some, some stalling in new projects while the CRES process was underway because of uncertainty. And so we can see from this chart, um, pre-CRES, Texas got up to about 8,000 megawatts of wind and then there's a, a cooling off period for about six years where not much got done during the CRES planning process. But these wires uh, just finished getting installed recently. And check out the post-CRES uh, ramp up, right? So, so we've gone from about 11 gigawatts to uh, about 26 gigawatts by 2017. These are projects that have made it through the interconnection process, uh, may or may not have financing. I mean, if I could just jump in quickly, it seems like Texas has really figured something out that a lot of other places haven't. Like, this is 15 gigawatts of wind in the near term, plus their, Texas's latest long-term analysis was forecasting another 20 gigawatts of solar. This is a huge amount of wind and solar, and it seems like Texas just has figured out the right combination of policy structures, market design, transmission additions. What, what facilitated that, that other people are struggling with more? I think that uh, there's a number of things that came together for Texas that maybe other parts of the country could or might not be able to emulate quite the way that Texas has done it. For starters, uh, as you know, the ERCOT uh, interconnect, which is most of but not all of Texas, uh, isn't subject to a variety of federal rules and regulations because they're not connected with the rest of the country. And that gives them the ability to be a little bit more nimble. Similarly, there's only one state legislature which governs the entire territory. So that's one way that Texas is, in fact, different. Um, Texas also has a remarkably wealthy uh, set of resources for both wind and solar. Some states have, are very good for wind, some states are very good for solar. Texas may be unique in that it is really, really rich for both. Um, and also, uh, not unique to Texas, but certainly part of Texas culture, uh, Texans love energy. Uh, it's an energy economy, it has been for a long time. And so I think Texans are loosely speaking, or many Texans are indifferent to the details. The point is there's money to be made providing energy and energy services for customers Folks want to get in on that and really support that, uh, and Texas has a long, a long history there. So they've got the resources, 
they're cost competitive, of course Texas is going to go for it. Uh, and are there, I, I mean, I've heard a little bit about the next step of transmission expansion in the, the panhandle, the PREZ projects. I think those are a little bit smaller scale, but they're going to continue to facilitate this next level of renewable energy resource integration. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I think PREZ is actually, if there is a lesson to be learned, I think it is in PREZ, not just in CREZ. So, so the idea of CREZ and MISO's MVP is let's build out some transmission to enable the renewable resource generation to get to load. But it takes a long time. It's maybe eight years between when the big idea comes and when those wires are put into service. And that's because there's planning. You've got to, you've got to test for reliability. You've got to line up investors. You've got to get rights of way. You've got to build it. And it's hard to imagine doing it much more quickly than that and doing a good job. But that's a long lag in the 21st century. And so what I love about PREZ is they didn't wait for five years after CREZ was completed to see if it worked. They said, even though CREZ is in the process, let's get started on PREZ anyway, because we know we're going to need more. And so it's not just doing one planning exercise to completion and then moving on to the next. It's doing multiple things simultaneously. That's different than us. We're going to do one topic and move on to the next. And I think we've got to move on to our next one. Uh, this is a mouthful, right? These are purple QFs. Uh, in 1978, the Public Utility Regulatory Policies Act, Section 210, was passed under President Jimmy Carter, and it is a Carter-era energy bill. It was designed to, amongst other things, let factories, mills, and other industrial customers generate electricity with waste heat or steam and sell it to the grid at the utility avoided cost. It also allowed renewable energy, but at the time, um, maybe people were imagining what we're seeing today and sometime what we'll see in the 2020s, but I don't think people expected it uh, to come right around the corner. So really it was focused on industrial customers and purpose set some parameters, but left much to the states to decide. It was a relatively low key, low interest issue in the 80s, 90s, and even in the last decade. Um, dockets weren't widely followed, not much changed. The same folks who were involved were involved every year or two, and it was pretty low key, but that all changed when renewable energy got cheap and scalable. And now the PURPA put, which is a long-term fixed rate contract for QFs, has become a potential play, and it's what we're gonna talk about for the next few minutes. So this is March 2016 EIA generation data for utility scale IPP PV. IPP or independent power producers PV, of course, is solar photovoltaic. This is where large scale utility not owned by the utility PV is happening. So half of it's in California, no one's really surprised by that. And we see Arizona and Nevada, that seems to make sense. You've got uh, lots of relatively cheap land and lots of sunshine. Then there's that North Carolina chunk and the rest of the U.S. Now I said this is IPP, but IPP is not necessarily QF. Um, so there's two ways that uh, utility scale solar can live and not be owned by the utility. One is um, an IPP, an independent power producer, approaches a utility and they just agree to make a deal. And that could happen any time and there's plenty of that. In fact, most of the California and Arizona PV in this image are not QFs. They just, uh, the utility made a deal with the developer for the energy and capacity and possibly for any renewable uh, value as well. Uh, the utilities uh, we're talking about are PG&E, SCE, SDG&E, all in California, as well as APS in Arizona. But Nevada and North Carolina have a different story. In, in that, these two cases, the utility wasn't voluntarily signing deals with IPPs. Instead, the IPPs built QS and got a PURPA put, got a long-term fixed contract, and it didn't matter if the utility thought it was a good idea or not, because PURPA doesn't give the utility the right to veto a contract that meets the PURPA standards. P.S., if anyone out there, uh, 
has access to or knows where we can find data on QF spy technology across states, i.e. the list. I love to see it. I've never been able to find a full list of QS in a state for a given technology. It's, uh, you can get little nibbles, bits and pieces, and it's a real challenge to put it all together. So if you've got that, um, or of course, if you have a question, send them into webinar at synapse-energy.com and uh, we'll do with it uh, as we must. So let's talk about North Carolina, right? North Carolina is a bit unusual in this list. Uh, great for basketball, but great for PV? Yeah, but why? The reason why North Carolina is a hotbed for PV QF development is that the commission has set out a set of parameters that make it attractive. And remember I said that PURPA has some parameters set by the federal government but leaves much to the states. In the state of North Carolina, the commission has made three decisions, and they made them a long time ago and have upheld them, that make uh, PVQFs attractive in the state. One is that um, you can get a PURPA put, you can get a fixed rate contract for any project that is not simply 100 kilowatts or less, but in fact that is 5 megawatts or less. And 5 megawatts is a nice size if you're a PV developer because you get many of the economies of scale um, in, a, in an installation as small as 5 megawatts. Secondly... Uh, Tommy, before you go on, I think that's a really good point that we shouldn't miss. These distribution level projects can provide a lot of value that I think a lot of other policy structures miss. I mean, there's a project in the one megawatt to five megawatt scale is very significantly less costly than like a rooftop TV installation. On a per also, megawatt basis. Yeah. yeah. And it also has a lot of benefits as to where you can site it. It might be easier to find a, a location than a 100 megawatt farm and you can get it closer to load. And I think these are all important characteristics that sometimes get ignored and whether it's intentional or maybe accidental because this policy has been around so long, I think it's a really interesting situation for North Carolina. No, I think just jump in one second. Yeah. We hear the word load from you guys. Just to make sure everybody on the line knows that they mean sales and they mean the population center. Yeah, so load is where customers are consuming the electricity, right? And so typically, we'd say in denser urban areas, but also uh, factories or other industrial sites could have a, a high load uh, consumption in a, in a small space that isn't, say, in a downtown urban area. Um, the other thing that's great about these sort of one to five megawatt projects is they can be on the distribution grid. They're small enough that, uh, not in every case, but in many cases, they can be on the distribution grid and avoid using up the transmission resource uh, at all, and that, that helps cut down the cost. So yeah, five megawatts is, is a nice size. Uh, another thing that's nice about, about North Carolina is these contracts are as long as 15 years. And so a 15-year fixed rate contract means that the developer can turn around to its financing options and say, let's come up with a 15-year payback. Right? Let's get a coupon that I pay back over 15 years um, and know that they're going to have the revenue coming in at a nice, steady, uh, known quantity. The sun's going to come up tomorrow. Uh, and pay back its loans. Shorter term contracts that puts much more risk on the developer and you know banks don't like risk and so they're less likely to finance or finance it in a more expensive rate. The third thing is the avoided cost. Uh, the commission, uh, the utilities uh, and the commission have determined with the help of some interveners that the avoided cost in North Carolina is large enough that uh, it works for PVQF. Now the the way they determine the cost has nothing to do with solar photovoltaic. It has to do with the fuel and the O&M and possibly the capital costs that Duke Energy Carolinas, that Duke Energy Progress, or that Dominion will avoid by not having to generate the electricity that that PURPA QF is generating. But as it turns out, that avoided cost is high enough that it's attractive for a QF PV facility in North Carolina. Yeah, that cost is really important, but what stands out to me here is the length of that certainty in that contract, which is really valuable to people. I mean, we'll we'll talk about other policy structures a little later that can have price signals that fluctuate, whether it's from a 
poor market design or good market design that just don't give you the certainty you need to make a big investment. And even at this small, small, in air quotes, project size of a megawatt, it's, a, it's real money. I mean, that's something people don't want to mess around with. Right. I think that's right. And so North Carolina may have some other reasons to build there. Land, uh, there are opportunities for land relatively cheap, thanks to tobacco farmers uh, finding a new line of work, and uh, a pretty, um, not quite a copper sheet, but, but transmission and distribution all over the state, so there's plenty of opportunities to plug in. But the fact of the matter is a lot of solar installations in North Carolina are 4.999 megawatts. And that's a clue that their QFs and that the QF structure in North Carolina uh, really mattered. Uh, so let's talk about renewable portfolio standards. Again, we'll remind folks we've gotten some questions already. Keep them coming to webinar at synapse-energy.com. A lot of folks know about RPS because RPS exists in about 30 states with another eight or 10 having goals. Uh, and RPS is a regulatory mandate to increase production of electricity from renewables. And that's about the only thing I can say about RPS and be correct in every state because every state's policy is different. Each reflects local concerns, politics, timing, cost, available resources, and so forth. And they're changing all the time. In the past uh, year or two, uh, Kansas and Ohio have uh, dampened down their RPS, but we've seen a number of states dramatically increase their RPS. California, Hawaii, Oregon, and Vermont uh, quite recently have uh, really thrown down the gauntlet to the other states and said, let's, let's go for broke on this. Uh, really, really impressive stuff. But we're not going to talk about those places. We're going to talk about this place. Uh, this place being the PJM Regional Transmission Organization, right? So these are the states that share a dispatch. Um, and you can see it on the map on the left there. So some places are well ahead of the RPS. Colorado, Hawaii, Minnesota, Washington, Nevada. Um, I had a conversation with Galen Barbosa of, of Lawrence Berkeley, and he's, he's really helped me with that sort of data. Um, and some places are lagging. New York is struggling to, meet, to reach its own goals. Um, some states in New England uh, once in a while fail to meet their annual goal. But again, we're going to focus on PJM. And recall from the map earlier that Kentucky and West Virginia, states within PJM, don't have an RPS policy. In Indiana, which has some PJM, is only a goal. But the other states, uh, Virginia also, excuse me, is, is only a goal. The other states in Washington, D.C. do have an RPS policy, so we can think about the regional RPS policy as the aggregate of the state policies. And we at Synapse were doing a study for a client in Maryland, uh, exploring the idea of Maryland increasing its RPS and asking the question, what does this mean for Maryland ratepayers? What does this mean uh, for emissions? But Patrick, we found something uh, at a bigger scale than that. Yeah, let me, let me quickly summarize this analysis that we did and uh, something that we, we came across in the process. So we were, we were looking at, as you said, expanding the Maryland RPS, uh, we looked at a couple different levels, a couple different policy levers, qualifying resources, but we were modeling the whole region because one important component of an RPS policy is you might be able to trade RPS compliance with another neighboring state. So it might be lower cost to buy wind from your neighbor 500 miles away than to build it on a ridge line next door. And that, that comes into play because we modeled all of PJM, all the RPS requirements as they stood at that point in this broader PJM region. And what we found was that all of those states, while they were sometimes working to together to comply with their RPS policies, the total RPS generation in those states corresponded to the RPS requirement. And you might say, well, that's common sense. There's a requirement, they're meeting it. Woohoo! Very insightful, Patrick. Uh, but it's, I think there's important things to be learned from this. I mean, just despite recent improvements in the cost of renewable energy resources, 
there could be some challenges to integration, some market barriers that you need to overcome to get new resources that make it difficult in some regions to comply with the RPS. And different levels of the RPS policy could push renewables to a higher level or set a, a minimum compliance point for, for future dates. Well, that's right. And, you know, we talked about it earlier. Some states are well ahead of their RPS obligation. Other states aren't currently meeting their self-imposed RPS obligation. So it isn't, in fact, obvious that a region's renewable energy generation will so tightly track its RPS uh, requirement, but that's what we found when we modeled PJM. So I think the lesson is um, maybe RPS isn't going to drive renewable energy in all places, and maybe RPS isn't going to get you what you dictate by the RPS. But in PJM, what we found was, in fact, it is the RPS that sure seems to be driving uh, renewable generation to a remarkable um, level of precision. So let's talk about rate making. Uh, this is a list of uh, the states with the most DGPV distributed uh, rooftop, if you will, solar panels per capita using March 2016 generation data. And so we see some folks we'd expect to see, right? Arizona, California, Nevada, uh, lots of great sunshine, and they're on the list. Um, we see Vermont and New Jersey who uh, don't have lots of great sunshine, but they do have uh, public policies that are very supportive. Uh, Colorado, maybe somewhere in between, but Hawaii up top, you know, Hawaii actually isn't as sunny as, as Arizona and California and Nevada. It's much closer to Colorado and most of America. It's sunny, but it's not sunny all the time, and yet they have three times as much PV as, uh, as California per capita. So what's going on? Yeah, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that Hawaii is fundamentally a different state than these other states here. The, the variable costs of generation, and if you want to skip ahead to your next slide, I think sure. that says some of that. The, the, just the electricity prices in Hawaii are very high. Most of their generation comes from older oil-fired units right now. So it's, it's very vulnerable to fluctuations in the oil price, and as oil prices go up, generation prices can get very high. So it, it just makes a lot of sense for customers to avoid paying that cost by installing rooftop PV. And up until last October, I believe, they had a relative, uh, what's a common policy in many states of net energy metering where the customer is compensated at the retail rate for all energy that they generate, even if they export some of that to the grid. Now that policy went away last year because there's some concerns that there's cost shifting happening. Hawaii has a very high fraction of PV generation. I think it's something like 32% of single family homes on Oahu, the, the island with the greatest population, have rooftop PV installed. So this is presenting a real challenge for commissioners, regulators, policymakers to think about how to address going forward. So what's, uh, what's in the future for Hawaii? What's in the future for Hawaii? That's a, that's a tough question to answer. So the, the new policy has a couple different structures. One of the, I believe the more popular one compensates uh, generation up to a customer's usage at the retail rate, but then any exported energy is compensated at a significantly low, lower weight rate. And we've done some initial analysis that shows that might increase the payback periods of these systems a few years, but that's all sort of yet to be seen. As you said, Hawaii has very aggressive renewable portfolio standard goals. They're going through a time of significant change in how their power system works. And so it's going to be interesting to see, given the constraints of the system, how they work with it. I think, I think there's a lot of caution to be taken from interpreting what happens in Hawaii because somewhere like even California, which was high on your list of per capita states, there's a huge ability to import and export energy from other states to 
balance the fluctuations in PV output, which just doesn't exist in Hawaii because you're an island. They're not even connected to the other islands in the state of Hawaii. So it sounds like folks on the mainland should keep an eye on what happens in Hawaii and look for lessons to be learned, but not to be careful not to just assume what's happening in Hawaii uh, would be applicable to wherever they are. Yeah, Hawaii, Hawaii is definitely pushing the boundaries and learning a lot about what can be done. One of the things that I'd be really interested to learn more about is they've increased the flexibility of, of a lot of these older oil-fired units to a degree that gives them a lot more ability to manage fluctuations in solar output that I think some of our, our mainland power operators could learn a lot from. Well, keep an eye. Let's move on to the production tax credit, the PTC. Uh, a breezy history, it was enacted in 1992 with a $15 per megawatt hour tax credit uh, to be adjusted for inflation, which is why it's up to about $23 a day. Uh, the credit duration is 10 years. Um, and, and remember, you only get it if tax credits uh, mean anything to you. If you're a government agency, for example, a PTC isn't particularly helpful. You're not paying taxes. Uh, the American Taxpayer Relief Act of 2012 made a fundamental change. No longer did your wind project have to be put into service before the expiration of the act. Instead, it had to have commenced construction, and the IRS has very careful and technical definitions for those. It's been allowed to expire four separate times in 99, 2002, 2004, in 2014, and its current iteration uh, passed in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2016, phases the Win PTC out uh, over the 27 through 2019 period, eliminating it in 2020. Uh, yeah, I, I think an important thing to keep in mind is what does this current iteration mean? I mean, I think. Congress has finally settled on a clear signal with a trajectory for phasing down this tax credit, but it sounds like you might be thinking there's some move, some room for that to move and adjust going forward. Yeah, Patrick, I'm sure forward. Congress would be thrilled to hear that you just suggested that they sat down in a bipartisan way, passed really good legislation that makes a ton of sense. Maybe they did. Um, however, I can't help but notice that the PTC um, has come and gone a number of times, and it wouldn't surprise me if sometime in 2019 or even after expiration in 2020, um, someone does some math and figures out that maybe the PTC isn't so important in Nebraska and Kansas and in that wind belt, but in other parts of the country, uh, developers really will still need that PTC to make the amount of renewable energy necessary for policy compliance happen, whether it's an RPS, whether it's a clean power plan, whether it's something else. So um, it's true that this is sort of some sort of ramped phase out, but I am not convinced that um, on January 1st, 2020, the PTC will disappear never to be heard from again. We'll see which of us is right. Come back, come back in four years for our next webinar, but let's look at what happened um, when, the, when, the, when the PTC was allowed to expire. Right? We said it, it expired four different times. And this is a chart of the megawatts of wind installed in each year. And we can see uh, the year following the expiration of the PTC, even if it was only expired for a few weeks, we saw a tremendous drop. And there's two different things going on here. I think we should be conscious of both. One thing that we're seeing is when a developer saw the PTC might expire at the end of the year or in 99 in July 1st, we would have expected the developer at least um, the first three goes round to ramp up their construction to make sure they got those wind turbines operating in time so that they got credit. And so part of what we're seeing in 99, 2001, and 2003 is the result of racing to finish your homework before the deadline. But wind projects aren't built in a week or a month. They take planning. And so I think that as we got closer months or even a half a year or a year away from PTC expiring, developers start wondering if they'll be able to get their project done in time. And so there weren't projects in the pipeline on the fear that the PTC would expire and not be 
reinstalled. Now, a little of that changes in 2013 because they changed the requirement for being eligible for the PTC from you have to have it finished to you have to have it started in. And so the 2013 process is a little bit different, but still here I think it's pretty clear um, when you have uncertainty around the PTC, you either uh, you go from getting nice, robust, steady, continuous growth in the industry to a dramatic stalling out. And so the where in this context is where on the timeline, not where in the country, but it is a, a where nonetheless. Yeah, before you go on, I, I definitely want to get to some of the questions from our audience, but I, I think it's important to keep in mind that the PTC is important. We've seen dramatic cost declines in wind power contracts. I mean, they've come down to $25, $30 a megawatt hour. In some parts of the country. In some parts yeah. of the country, yeah, and that's what I was going to say. It's There's other parts of the country where the economics aren't as crazy in favor of wind, and it's it's more borderline. Uh, there's the capacity factor that you get, the annual production from your wind turbine might not be a 50% capacity factor. It might be a 35%. Well, and in addition, uh, in some parts of the country, you're just not going to get a 300 megawatt wind farm. Mm -hmm. You're going to get a 12 or a 25 megawatt wind farm, and all of these fixed costs associated with site selection engineering, attorneys, um, you don't get that economies of scale. So that's another reason why the cost might be higher, uh, for example, in the Northeast or even in the East in general. Yeah, and I think there's still progress to be made in terms of getting the technology and the systems and the regulations to a point to facilitate all this energy and the PTC can help push that forward. Absolutely. So we've talked about renewable energy historically, and so I guess I'd ask the folks listening in to think, will new renewable energy generation capacity appear here where you are, and not just there, like the places that we talked about? <laughs> well, thank you, Tommy and Patrick. That was a great presentation. Uh, we're going to move on to questions now, but first I'll take a minute here to go through a little bit of information uh, about Synapse and, and the information that we're providing so that we can make way for questions. First of all, we'd love to hear from you uh, and to be able to work together with all of you out there on the line. Uh, let's get in touch. Let's talk about what sort of uh, possibilities there are for collaborating and for, for finding uh, work that, uh, that connects. Uh, we have a lot of great resources for you up on our website, a uh, lot of different things that may be of use to folks on the phone. I know some of you have seen these before. There's just some examples here, our CO2 price forecast and so on. Uh, check it out. Anything that we can make public, we do make public, and it's all up there on the website. Uh, and here are different ways that you can connect with us uh, in the, our, the rest of our webinar series. I was telling you about future webinars, but we're going to take probably a, a break on public webinars during the summer when we know you all are busy too. Uh, but you can see all of our past webinars and any future ones up on the website. Uh, you want to keep an eye out for an upcoming podcast, Behind the Switch, being released by Synapse in conjunction with EESI. So keep your eye out for that. We are on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn, and we actually are build people with a physical address, and that's what that is there. Uh, so thanks to everybody who's joining us and sending in questions. Please send in more. Uh, I'm going to get going on asking them of the presenters, but uh, if you have a question and you'd like me to ask it of the presenters, send it to webinar at synapse-energy.com, and I will keep an eye on my email to, to keep looking at that. So here's your first question. Uh, you started out talking about of your, your five things. Your first was transmission, how transmission can, can bring renewables. I, I think a lot of people on the phone uh, think of transmission product projects as being expensive. These are very big infrastructure projects a lot of the time. Uh, so explain a little bit more. Uh, Projects that are meant to bring renewables uh, to load, to the sales, uh, how do we pay for them? Who pays for them? How does that work? Sure. The answer, of course, is it depends. 
um, in ISOs and RTOs, um, the, the agency will take a look at who's benefiting from the project, and that could be a reliability benefit, that could be an economic benefit. When transmission helps a lower co cost resource get to load, it saves the ratepayers money because we're able to dispatch a less expensive resource instead of a more expensive resource. And so there can be benefits associated with reliability, there can be benefits associated with economics, and there can be policy benefits, and this is sort of a throwback to the MISO MVP. And so it's up to that uh, regional uh, transmission organization to determine which uh, entities are benefiting and therefore how to allocate that cost. Um, typically, though, these projects do save money, and so instead of thinking about these as added costs, it often makes a lot more sense to think about these as investments in reducing total system costs. And you can think about it the same way as other transmission investments are recovered through rates on the system. I mean, we build new transmission for all sorts of purposes, to bring new conventional resources, to improve reliability, to bring more energy to load centers that are changing or growing. And you can think about it, transmission for renewables in the same way as providing a broad system benefit. Okay, thanks. I'm going to ask you two questions about PERFA now. I'll start out with one that is, uh, what do you see coming down the line on PERFA? What, what are the, the next states to have uh, PERFA facilities? Is it the same states, just more, or are there other states that are right for uh, new purpose facilities? So I, I, think it, I think it is going to change uh, in some regards for two different reasons. The first is, um, this is uh, maybe a pessimistic view, um, because uh, by its very nature, PERPA puts our contracts that the utility didn't ask for but is obligated to accept. Uh, many utilities don't like this loss of ability to plan, don't like this loss of ability to build their own and collect recovery on. And so uh, we're seeing in a number of states utilities go to state commissions and say that five megawatt value that North Carolina does, let's make it 100 kilowatts. That 15 year time period, let's make it one year. Um, and in doing so, make it difficult or impossible for PVQF development that we've seen in Nevada, that we've seen in North Carolina to happen in that state. We're seeing that now. Um, these sleepy QF dockets, these sleepy per PERPA dockets are now uh, not so sleepy anymore. We're seeing uh, renewable developers as interveners. We're seeing environmental organizations as interveners. And we're seeing consumer advocates start to pay much closer attention than we had in the past. And so part of it is going to be decided state by state in the commission. Um, however, we do know that there are some states that have quite a bit of PVQF in the queue. Uh, Utah is an example. Um, for a while, I, I should have checked, I didn't, if it's, to see if it's still true, Utah was allowing 80 megawatt QFs. And so if a half a dozen show up and say, we're building, that's 480 megawatts of PV uh, that the utility sort of has to accept. And even if that's built in southern Utah, despite the vast majority of the load being north in, in Salt Lake, uh, the utility has to figure out how to, how to deal with that. So I think we'll see uh, Utah, uh, Georgia we may see some, and even Vermont um, as of this moment has um, rules governing PVQFs and all QFs, uh, renewable or CHP, that have enough of the parameters that make development um, more tangible. Mm -hmm. I also got some questions that are specific about PERPA in particular states. I think I'll let you answer those offline since they're one state or another. Sure. Um, but here's a question that is uh, about wind and uh, asking for you to distinguish between onshore and offshore wind, uh, maybe across all five of your, your points that you made. Yeah, uh, there are important distinctions. Offshore wind is something that we in America do not have nearly as much practice with. Uh, sometimes the, the long transmission lines that you need for onshore wind, things like the MVP projects, aren't as important for offshore wind because you build it 
off the coast and you just need one underwater cable to bring it online. But those are, they tend to be very expensive projects, so you need some sort of other incentive to get this resource off the ground. And it can be a valuable resource because it tends to provide more reliable power, just more power in general. You can build a bigger wind farm without having to worry about quite the same siting challenges as onshore wind. Uh, and offshore wind can contribute to RPS policies. You can design an RPS policy that facilitates all sorts of resources, including offshore wind. Yeah, and so right now offshore wind looks expensive, and in some ways it's there may be some lessons from uh, PERPA and from in Massachusetts we had legislation 83 and 83A. Um, they need that long-term contract at a price that covers the cost of construction. Unlike fossil fuel plants, the vast majority of the cost in a wind farm is construction. And so you've got to have uh, locked up revenue over a number of years that covers that construction cost. So I think uh, one of the key takeaways is if you want offshore wind, um, you've got to promise to pay for it. But in terms of the RPS, for example, those two things look basically the same. Is that right? In most states. Um, However, it's certainly within, it's not uncommon for states with RPS policies to have subsets of requirements for certain technologies. A very common one is DGPV or PV in general. So not only do you need, I'm making up a number, 10% renewables, but of that 10%, a certain fraction of it might have to be PV. But one could do the same thing with offshore wind. One could have the requirement that some fraction of our RPS must be met with offshore wind. However, REC prices, uh, unless the REC is sold as part of a long-term contract, that subsidy from the RPS is not a reliable and constant piece of revenue because the value of a REC can fluctuate dramatically year to year. And so it's not obvious to me that, an, that, say, a carve-out from an RPS will be sufficient to get offshore wind. I think you really need those long-term contracts to get anyone to, to, to sink down the, the time and the capital to get it built. Yeah, I think it's just such a nascent industry as compared to the other resources that you have. It, it needs more directed support than something like onshore wind. And, and that commitment of support. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Patrick, here's a question for you. Uh, two weeks ago, and you're doing your presentation about the new normal and, and what we're looking forward to with new prices and renewables going down, uh, gas prices looking different in the future. Uh, there, it seemed like what was going to be driving renewables in the future were those lowering costs over time. Here, we're talking about RPS policies driving renewables. Which one is it? Is it is this one or the other? Is it both? How do you explain that? It's definitely a, a little bit of both. Uh, the, the lowering cost of renewable resources makes it easier to comply with RPS policies. I would say still in a number of states across the country, there remain all sorts of market barriers to new renewable energy that could be dealt with through changing market structures. They could be dealt with through regulators developing new new ways to consider resources. Uh, but one way to do it is an RPS policy. If you give a resource uh, an additional little push to get over that hump of the, the market barriers from system operators who aren't as comfortable dealing with these resources or siting challenges that people might not be used to in the same way they are for other plants. These are still things that well, they get more and more easy to attain as the cost of these resources go down. We still have to push past them to really fully utilize them. It's a, the United States is a diverse place with uh, great diversity of resource availability and, and electric sales. And so, um, yeah, I don't think a, specific, a single policy or a single economic trend will tell the story everywhere. We've had some questions about storage. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the relationship between new storage, battery storage especially, and uh, renewables? 
How does it fit into the, the picture that you're drawing here? Sure. Uh, unfortunately, it's not nearly as exciting as I think people imagine it will be. Um, we're not there yet. And by that I mean this. Um, in most places, we'll keep our Hawaii caveat alive. In most places, um, we have physical assets now that allow us to integrate the renewables uh, that already exist. And so the idea of spending money to, to buy storage when, frankly, it doesn't have tremendous economic value now um, is a bad deal. And that doesn't really change if that storage is a battery pack in your garage, a one megawatt um, bit of storage somewhere uh, on the grid, or, or a, uh, a new 700 megawatt um, old-fashioned piece of storage, pumped hydro. Generally speaking, it's not the least cost resource. There are exceptions to that big and small, though. So it wouldn't surprise me if Hawaii starts becoming a, a reasonable place to put targeted storage in, if nothing else, to free up capacity on distribution level wires and avoid those upgrades. California is rolling out some storage um, in part because they think it can be economic, in part because they want to drive it toward being economic uh, and do some experimentation and help bring down the costs. And there are specific places where storage can be really, really nice. Um, we've seen some, some New York City installations of storage that deferred uh, really, really costly upgrades to the distribution system. And so that was sort of a, a surgical strike. You can put storage in exactly the right place and avoid some other big cost. And we'll continue to see that. There's also been some, some recent studies about using storage perhaps um, to reduce exposure uh, of harmful emissions, particularly in social justice neighborhoods. Can we use storage to not use those dirty peaker plants on the hours of the year when asthma risks are higher and air pollution is a real problem? So there's, there's places where storage makes sense. Today, those places will continue to increase, but um, just as PV um, was really, really small for a long time before it finally uh, looks like it sort of hit the elbow, I think storage is going to be really small for, for a number of years. There's still plenty of room to do RE before we need uh, the storage for integration or cost. Right, yeah, and just to dig into that a little bit more, it's storage can certainly provide some value in terms of load balancing and dealing with the fluctuations of wind and solar resources that aren't always entirely predictable, but there's a lot of low-hanging fruit to deal with that as well, just better cooperation amongst the system operators all over the country. And we have this nationwide machine that operates sometimes I think somewhat magically to balance supply and demand in all hours. And if we fully utilize that, all the variation in resources available can provide us a lot of capability to deal with that. So keep, I mean, we gotta keep working on storage. We need to keep looking for places to use it, keep thinking about different ways it can add value and how to collect multiple value streams together. Um, and I hope that folks don't interpret what we're saying as, bah, storage, you know, maybe maybe in the 2030s. That, I don't mean to convey that at all. Simply that, you know, energy efficiency is really low cost and we're not doing nearly enough of that. And that obviates the need for, for storage and for generation. Um, there are other places we can go to look and find uh, much bigger pieces of value, and so let's keep working on storage, let's keep uh, up with the technology, and keep experimenting with actual deployment, but keep in mind that there are other places where we can uh, reduce costs, reduce emissions, uh, and so forth at much lower prices than, than storage allows for today. I think it might be helpful for some folks uh, that are participants right now in the webinar to hear you break it down just a little bit in terms of explaining the relationship between uh, the capacity, the generating capacity that we need in each of our regions, the peak uh, demand in electricity each year, and then how we're serving that and, and to, to help people understand the relationship between peak and how much capacity we need and you were just talking about using, you know, some very dirty generators to hit those those peaks at certain times, um, or maybe to use storage to to deal with those peaks. Can you just explain that a little more for people that aren't as familiar with it? 
Yeah, why don't I take a first stab at that and then I'll let Tommy chime in. Uh, so we've got, uh, at this moment, we have a set amount of capability of energy we can produce at any given minute, and that's the, the capacity of all the existing resources. Uh, we have a load that we have to meet, which is somewhat, is I was going to say somewhat, I'll say significantly less than the total capacity of resources. That capacity is built to meet the peak demand, the highest hour of electricity demand on the system. And usually it's something significantly greater than that peak demand, so we ensure that we meet it because as a society we place a lot of value on the reliable provision of electricity. Uh, so we have to make sure that we can meet those loads, balance supply and demand at all hours. And wind and solar contribute to that to some extent because they might be producing energy at that peak hour, but they aren't flexible in the sense that you can turn them on and off just at a flip of a switch. Uh, so we have to think about how these resources all work together to continue balancing supply and demand. Yeah. So Patrick talked about the capacity, right? That's keeping the lights on at any given moment because not only do we not know uh, with precision exactly when customers are going to put the toaster oven on, although we, we have a statistical understanding and we, we understand its relationship with weather, we also don't know when uh, a transformer is going to trip or a coal pile is going to freeze, making the coal not available to that generator. Um, so all of our equipment breaks some of the time, and we have to make sure we have the capacity to deal not only with the cloudy day or the day without wind, but also the day when um, there's not enough gas available locally because it's all being used for heating and, there's, and, and the, the power plants haven't reserved their share. Uh, but there's also the energy side, right? So that's where we think about renewables most of the time for most of their value today. Um, we would we still need that capacity to meet those reliability requirements, but every hour that we can turn the gas plant or the coal plant off and instead use wind or solar or geothermal or so forth, we're saving money by not procuring those fuels and we're reducing pollution by not emitting those pollutants. And while it's true in some specific cases, timing matters. For example, you know, poor air quality days uh, in parts of California. With respect to, for example, carbon pollution, it doesn't really matter if the emission avoided is at 2 a.m. or at 2 p.m. or if it's avoided in Nevada or Nebraska. The ton of CO2 is a ton of CO2, and anywhere we can avoid it, we're deriving the same benefit. Um, and so. It's a little tricky to get hung up on energy and capacity, and, and we constantly hear, well, but, you know, what happens when people want electricity at night um, or the wind isn't always blowing? And that's true, um, and sometimes we'll, we're, we're going to use conventional generators or perhaps eventually storage to deal with that. But the fact of the matter is, um, even in Hawaii, we're still nowhere near running off just renewable energy. We're still going to be using um, nuclear and fossil generators uh, for quite some time, and the more RE we have, the less we'll rely on those generators both for energy and for capacity. Yeah, that's a good place to end, and we are out of time. So thank you again, Tommy and Patrick. This was a great presentation, and thanks for everybody who joined us on the call. Thanks very much. Thanks.